you for inviting me. Um, so, as Peter was saying, I'm going to uh, explain our recent work on mapping the zoonotic niche of Ebola virus disease in Africa. So, as a, as a bit of a background, there are five species of Ebola virus that have been reported, four of which are pathogenic to humans. Um, in the mid-1970s, there were two concurrent but independent outbreaks in southern Sudan and the DRC, which were identified as being unique in comparison to all other outbreaks beforehand, mainly due to their high uh, case fatality rates and onset of hemorrhagic symptoms. Um, these viruses were subsequently isolated and found to be two distinct species, which were then classified as Sudan and Zaire Ebola virus. Um, you can see from the, the graph at the bottom here that after 1979, there was, there was a period of 15 years where we saw no human reported cases of Ebola virus, although the fifth species of Ebola virus, Reston Ebola virus, was found in imported monkeys into America. Um, it wasn't until 1994 that we saw our next case, which was a, a veterinarian that performed an autopsy on a chimpanzee in the Thai forest and subsequently became sick and Thai forest Ebola virus was isolated from that individual. Since that time, we've seen a number of outbreaks, none reaching above more than 500 cases and being fairly restricted in ge geographic area. Uh, and then a fifth strain of Ebola virus, Bundigabo, was discovered in 2007. Uh, you'll notice the very large recent outbreak in Guinea, which dwarfs all the others in comparison by being greater than the sum total of all other cases that we have seen of Ebola virus outbreaks. So part of our work was to try and understand what, what's going on. Is there any inherent differences in these situations? Just a brief outline of what we do and don't know about the dynamics of Ebola virus. Given how high the case fatality rate can be and how rare we see outbreaks in humans, it was fairly obvious that humans weren't the sole hosts for Ebola virus. In the mid-1990s, we saw significant die-offs in chimpanzee colonies and gorilla colonies. But again, the high, the high case fatality rate meant that these non-human primates were also likely to be, to be only susceptible hosts rather than those that are responsible for maintaining infection in wildlife. Um, so over the, over the last decade, significant work has been done looking at small mammal species and particularly in bat, bat species where a number have been identified to have the virus circulating within them or signs that the virus has been circulating within their populations. I think this is also very good at outlining the, the, the one health aspect of this disease in that we have zoonotic transmission within species and between species, and then occasional spillovers, so transmission from animals to humans, and then the second aspect of the disease propagation where it's, it's solely human-to-human -human based transmission. So our work was looking at the potential for zoonotic transmission of Ebola virus in wildlife and therefore try and make inference as to where areas are at risk of potential spillover from animals to humans. So our work started by doing some fairly in-depth detective investigation of how, how and where these outbreaks arose. So you'll see on the left that there's all the human outbreaks listed that we could find up to and including the Guinea outbreak in 2000 that started in December 2013. Um, in the end, we found that there were 30 reported cases of this transition from an animal to human. Um, for about half of them, we had evidence, or it was strongly suggested that it was linked to something like bushmeat hunting or butchering of animal carcasses. For the other ones, we had to use the assumption that the first index human case was actually in the vicinity of where a potential zoonotic transmission event occurred. We also included animal surveys, and you'll see that it's, it's highly biased towards um, uh, non-human primate sanctuaries, particularly on the Congo-Gabon border, and also in the Thai forest in the Ivory Coast. We found that in addition to gorillas and chimpanzees, about five different species of bats have had some 
evidence of uh, Ebola virus infection in them. Um, just a very brief outline of the methodology that we use. So we, we use this data in a species distribution modeling context, specifically boosted regression trees, which takes present data and combines it and compares it to absence data in the context of a whole lot of environmental covariates that are relevant to Ebola, and then attempts to define a rule set by which the environmental conditions for zoonotic transmission can occur. It then takes this information and then makes inferences about areas where we don't know if the, the virus is present and compares their similarities between these two areas. <clears throat> We used a variety of covariates, including elevation, measures of vegetation indices, uh, land surface temperature, potential evapotranspiration, and then also a function of the bat distribution. So of the, the variety of bat species that have been surveyed, only in three species have we had what I view as a more gold standard evidence that these are potential reservoirs for, for Ebola virus. Um, these are the hammer-headed bats, the little collared fruit bat, and Frankette's epauletted fruit bat. Um, for each of these bats, we ran separate species distribution models to try and get a better understanding of where these species are. You'll notice that there's little, little black dots or occurrence points, which are taken from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And the black outline there is the IUCN red list expert opinion maps of where they believe the species are. So we, we use the boosted regression tree models to try and refine estimates of where the bat species exactly are within these broad expert opinion areas. And then to supply it to the model at the end, we consolidated all of these into one single covariate. So here we have the predicted zoonotic niche map of Ebola virus. In total, 22 areas can be considered at risk of potential animal to human transmission of Ebola virus. You'll note that some countries have a, a hard outline around them where it's, this is where this transition has actually been observed, while some other countries are dotted, which is areas where there's predicted risk, but we are yet to have seen this zoonotic spillover occurring. Um, People living within, there were approximately 22 million people live within these areas at risk, mainly in the DRC, and 97% 90 of all these areas were actually rural areas as opposed to urban centres. One of the things that we were interested in seeing is whether Guinea was an, an ecological outlier or was it, con was it consistent with the the rest of the outbreaks that we've seen mainly focused in Central Africa. So on the left, we have a model run without the Guinea data point, and on the right, there, there's the model as pre presented in the previous slide, and I, I promise you they are different. Um, they're very similar in their spatial extent, but you'll notice that for the, when you supply the, the Guinea data set, it increases the the highest category of probability of infection in those areas. So you'll notice that there's more red in the peripheral areas of the Guinean forests as opposed to when you exclude the Guinea data set. So if there's ecological possibility that these are one and the same outbreaks, what, is there any other reasoning why um, we're seeing the, the, the huge epidemic that we're currently noticing in Guinea? So one of the things that we looked at was the changes in the underlying human populations. So I've, on the top there, I've just outlined um, the populations at risk for each specific country. Um, but you'll notice that from 1976 to 2012, that all those countries have at least doubled in population size. Some have, tri have tripled. And that there's an increasing... Uh, urban population within these countries. The other thing that we considered was changes in the connectivity between these countries. So we have outbound passenger seat capacity at the top and pa outbound passenger volume from these countries. And the vast majority have seen considerable increases. And this is over the last six years. 
Similarly, they're, not only are they interconnected within the African subcontinent, but also to the rest of the world. So we see that all areas have seen an increase in the connectivity through flight. So the, the niche map has the potential to help inform our understanding of where, where the zoonotic transmission of this disease is occurring. I think one of the take-home messages is that whilst our, there's a significant increase in our understanding of the epidemiology of Ebola in the last decade, there's still a vast number of unknowns. So maps such as the predicted niche map could be used to direct focus of where you should be surveying animals particularly in countries which are on the, the periphery of that and haven't previously been recognised as, poten as potentially being at risk of Ebola virus. And we need to try and better understand the, the nature of the disease in the animals within those areas. The, most, the current outbreak, however, represents a completely different challenge in that it's now transitioned from this human-to-human -human phase. The... The genetic evidence suggests that actually there's only been one transition from animals to humans and all subsequent disease spread has been human to human transmission. So one way that our group and in collaboration with a lot of others is to try and understand how this spatial dynamics could be related to patterns in human behavior. So one of the things we're trying to look at is mobility and connectedness of these districts to see if it can help in some way predict or preempt where the bowler is going to spread next. Equally, within the, this has a lot, this methodology, methodology can be applied to a variety of other One Health targets, particularly those that have this dual stage of zoonotic transmission, then subsequent zoonotic spillover into humans, and then human to human control. So some of the diseases that we're looking at amongst other groups is Marburg, which is another phylovirus that's related to Ebola virus. Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, which is a tick-borne um, virus, and Lassa fever, which is from rodents. Um, I think the framework that we have is ideal for understanding where the, the spillover events are going to occur, and then hopefully the future human-to-human -human interaction based models could be used to understand where these are going to propagate later. So I've started doing some work on Marburg recently. It's very data sparse, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what can be done, but that's the, the very early indications. So I'd like to thank um, all my co-authors, most of whom are, are here today, and particularly Nick for helping me helping guide me through the pitfalls of species distribution models. So, thank you.